and then we'll get started. So I think I'll start now and um, people can just come in while I'm doing the introduction. So good morning, everyone. My name is Kiara Singh and I'm Institute Development Associate here at the Gene Golding Institute. On the next slide, you can see that we have started Bristol Data Week 2023. It's an interactive program of speakers, training and workshops, all free of charge and open to all that we run every year. This will be our sixth year of running Bristol Data Week. And we hope to showcase the latest in data science and AI, and it's an opportunity to gather feedback from our community. And if there's any events that you think you'd really like to, to see next year, please do let us know so we can include it in the program. So this session would be led by Detlef Nack, a BT Distinguished Engineer and Head of BT's AI and Data Science Research Programme, and will be considering the opportunities and risks of generative AI, exploring examples of what is possible, and also discussing the shortfalls. Um, so just some housekeeping before we begin. Uh, all our in-person and online events follow the Gene Golding Institute Code of Conduct. Um, the link is in the chat box, thanks Elaine. It just sets out some guidelines for everyone taking a part so that this can be a welcoming, friendly and supportive virtual environment. Please do take a look. We'll also be recording this event for those who can't attend online today. Uh, feel free to switch your videos on or off. It would be nice to see some faces when we have the Q&A part of the event taking place after the presentation if you're asking a question. Um, please do keep your microphones muted if you're not pre present presenting or asking a question for the comfort of all attendees. And throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, just enter them into the chat box and um, we will monitor that and come to them at the end. Please also feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Um, so in the next slide, um, I'm going to talk about um, the JGI is like one of five University of Bristol research institutes. And we're a hub for data science, artificial intelligence, and data intensive research. We aim to connect multidisciplinary experts across the university and beyond. Um, for example, we have a seed corn funding scheme, which staff and postgraduate students can apply to. Um, to get projects off the ground that tackle societal challenges and hopefully lead to positive impact and engagement with our local and international communities. And you can read more about those projects on our website. So our institute is named after Jean Golding OBE, who is a mathematician and epidemiologist, renowned as the founder of the Children of the 90s, ALSPAC cohort study, which stands for the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. Um, the ALSPAC data explains sudden death infant syndrome and has generated more than 2,000 scientific publications. Um, you might see Jean around the campus today as she still works actively with the university. On the next slide, you'll see we're also partnered with the Alan Turing Institute based in London the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, and their mission is to make great leaps in research in order to change the world for the better. Um, so you can see on the next slide that we try and align with this Turing strategy with our four priority work streams, um, data-driven solutions to societal challenges. So we work with internal and external partners to develop these solutions to tackle challenges facing society data governance and reproducibility. Um, so we support open accessible science and best practice and research within and beyond the university again. And data visualization and materiality, supporting how we explore how data is conceptualized, how people imagine, understand and experience data and data science and AI fundamental research. You can see we support these four work streams with cross-cutting activities, developing communities through data, bringing researchers together to tackle challenges with complex data sets, for example. Also training in professional de de development op opportunities, such as our Bristol Data Week. And we also have our Ask JGI Data Science Consultancy Service, where we try and support researchers at all stages of their career. 
In the next slide, you can see the wide range of activities taking place during day two week with the seminars in orange, the training in blues, workshops in green and social activities in pink. We have over 30 activities taking place this week and a mix of online and in-person events. Please do take a look as there's something for everyone and you might like to sign up to some of the sessions later on in the week. And we want to say a big thank you to all our generous sponsors, without which we couldn't have been able to create this week. And it's always great to collaborate with new and existing um, partners. Um, and many of them aren't featured on this slide, um, but without them, we wouldn't be able to make this week full of exciting offerings that is free and open to all. On the next slide, I just want to highlight an event we have coming up on Thursday. So if you're based in Bristol, close to us, you might like to join us at the Bristol Beacon in the centre of town for Connect, Collaborate, Create with Data Science and AI. And this is an event revolving around collaboration with communities using data and AI to create more inclusive cultures. Um, so you might want to join us for our panel discussion with MP Darren Jones or for one of our inclusive data workshops in the afternoon. We also have a complimentary lunch and there's going to be loads of interactive exhibits. So do come down uh, and book a space via the link in the chat box if you are around. And finally, please feel free to tweet and share your views using hashtag Bristol Data Week on Twitter or via LinkedIn. And do keep in touch with us after Data Week. You can connect with us in many different ways or subscribe to our mailing list to keep up to date with future events. If you have a data science query, do email ask-jgi at bristol.ac.uk and we will try and help you out with that. So if you could stop sharing the slides in Tizar, and hopefully uh, Detlef will be able to share his. Um, as mentioned earlier, do enter any questions and comments into the chat box and we will come to them. And so without further ado, let me introduce Detlef Nock. Detlef is a BT Distinguished Engineer and the head of BT's AI and Data Science Research Programme. A key part of his work is to establish best practice best practices in AI and machine learning, leading to the deployment of safe, responsible and auditable AI solutions that are driving real business value. The AI research program also covers areas like NLP, generative AI, federated learning, distributed AI and the social impact of AI adoption. Detlef is a computer scientist by training and holds a PhD and a postdoctoral degree habilitation in machine learning and data analytics. He has over 30 years of experience in AI and data, and he is a visiting professor at Bournemouth University and a private docent at the University of Magdeburg in Germany. He has published three books, over 120 papers, holds 15 patents, and has 30 active patent applications. So over to you, Detlef. Thank you very much, Chiara. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about generative AI today. And uh, we have seen, we have never seen such a massive change in AI over the, uh, like we have seen over the last six months or so. Um, you are probably well aware of many of these events. Uh, ChatGPT has been released um, end of November last year. And then in February, um, Microsoft announced that it's going to release um, GPT-4, essentially the successor of the model that ChatGPT is built on uh, as part of its search engine Bing. And you now actually can go to uh, Bing and you can use this capability and ask questions. And it now even has an image creator built in for you to play with. Um, interestingly, in, in the past, Google was always seen ahead in, in terms of generative AI, in particular large language models. And But now Microsoft and, and uh, OpenAI have essentially overtaken Google. Google had an event in, in, in Paris just after the uh, Microsoft announcement, and they um, were a bit unlucky with the presentation. Their large language model BART made a mistake, and subsequently Google's shares 
fell by 8%. And that shows you the kind of hype and expectation in this space. Everybody is, is really uh, looking into this generative AI space, large language models, and expects a lot of value being created in this space. And so everybody who is lagging behind is essentially penalized by the market. In uh, mid-March, there are- Apologies, Betlef. I just wanted to point out, I don't think the slides are moving. You ca can you see the, the slide with the cartoon? No, it's still on the first slide. So you might have to uh, press the arrows on the slide deck. Okay. Anything moving now? No. Okay. Sorry about this. Let me. It's okay. There's always technical things that come up from time to time. Screen. I'll try this again. Yes, we can see the animation now. Okay, I go to the next slide. Has the slide changed? Yes, yes, that's working now. Okay, good, excellent. Right, so this was the timeline. And uh, mid-March, um, an open letter from the Future of Life Institute appeared that uh, warned of the dangers of large language models. And um, since then, uh, a lot of the public uh, debate has been informed by um, what are these models good for and how risky are they and um, how should they be regulated. Um, on 1st of May, Jeff Hinton has left Google. Jeffrey Hinton is one of the key figures in AI who has um, developed a lot of the technology that we are using today. Um, the um, EU has started voting on its AI Act, which regulates AI. And um, uh, the Senate in the US had a hearing where Sam Altman, the CEO of uh, OpenAI, appeared and talked about regulation. So we had uh, basically six months ago a lot of hype in the, in the field, and now we're starting to see uh, kind of worry and talks about regulation and, and the dangers of AI. So what is this all about? Um, I want to briefly uh, go into the beginnings of this technology. Where does it all come from? And uh, we have to go back about 10 years when people try to build AI models that can recognize faces. And uh, they used so-called deep networks for it. Deep network is um, uh, a term for a structure that is based on what's called an artificial neural network, which is very, very vaguely uh, aligned to um, kind of brain structures. So it is, consists of very simple computational units that can be active or inactive, and they're all connected by, uh, by weights, and they can be trained by uh, learning algorithms, in, in particular an algorithm called backpropagation. And so what you do when you want to train such a model, you, you need a lot of example data. So in this case, uh, faces of pictures, and you train the model with these examples until it can uh, recognize these examples in the way you want it to recognize them. The um, problem when you um, train something like recognizing faces or anything else, essentially, you need to provide uh, positive and negative examples. So you need to provide examples for faces and anything else that is not a face. But you can't really have an exhaustive list of things that are not faces. So they came up with a trick. They used actually two deep networks. One that is called the discriminator that is supposed to recognize faces and say, yeah, that's a face or no, that's not a face. And then they used another network that created fake faces out of random noise. And um, this was then used as an input into the discriminator together with the real data of real faces. And the discriminator had to learn to accept real faces and to reject the fake faces generated by the generator. And if you train this long enough with uh, enough examples of faces, we are talking millions, then what you get is you get two deep networks for the price of one. You get a discriminator network that can identify faces, but you also get a, a generator network that can create fake faces that look like real faces. And if you go to this website, this person does not exist. 
you um, get a fake face every time you click refresh and they look uh, really if you it's very difficult to distinguish them from from real people so this is the original deep fake and this has kicked off a lot of development in this space and also a lot of problems of course deep fakes in itself are a problem um, and um, uh, it's also the first time that people were aware that you can bake bias into these models because uh, it turns out that uh, faces of um, white men are more easily recognizable than faces of uh, people with darker skin or um, female faces. And this is because of bias in the training data. Basically, too many white men in the training data and not enough women and, and people with dark faces. And so this kicked off not only this uh, kind of capability of being able to recognize images with deep networks, but also the first discussion around um, ethical and responsible AI and how do we attack these kind of questions around bias. The next step in the process was then um, using these networks on language and um, Google built translator networks. So Google Translate since 2015 roughly is using deep networks to translate between languages and that worked quite well uh, already back then. And then in um, 2016 or so, they um, developed a technology called transformer networks. And this is basically underpinning the whole technology around large language models, deep networks that can generate language. And it works like uh, we can see in this little animation, what you do is you have to put some text in and it then tries to guess what's the next word in this sequence. And this is essentially how these models work. They're statistical models and they predict the next word in a sequence of words. So they work a little bit like your, the predictive text on your phone, but obviously they're much more capable because they have been trained with terabytes of text and they're massive, they're truly large. So the GPT-3, the model that underpins ChatGPT when it was released had 175 billion parameters. A parameter is a, a number like a, a real valued number, it needs four bytes to be um, presented in computer memory. So that means you need roughly um, 700 gigabyte of memory to run ChatGPT in a machine. So these models are um, truly massive. But they showed <clears throat> very interesting and, and surprising capabilities. They can generate language that looks like it has been written by a person. And um, the this at roughly at the same time, like ChatGPT, we saw these models come out that could generate images from language. They are called diffusers or diffusion networks. And what they do is they take random noise at input as input and a description of a picture, and then they produce an image. And this is an original image, not an image that is retrieved from a list of images. So here's an example. The text, teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals as mad scientists in a steampunk style was created um, by a model called DALI2, also developed by OpenAI. So basically, um, nowadays what we have, we have uh, deep networks that can generate text and we have deep networks that can generate images. So just a, a, another look at how you build something like this. So let's look at ChatGPT. The first thing you need to do is you need to train this network, this deep network with 175 billion parameters with text. It needs to learn to predict the next word in a sequence of text. And that in itself is the biggest and most expensive period of training. But uh, you're not done. When you, If you want something like ChatGPT, you actually want a, a model that can respond to questions. And so you need to put a bit more effort into this. And so what they did after they built the basic capability of uh, predicting the next word, they continue training the model with question answer uh, examples. So they collected a lot of data that demonstrated this is a question, this is an answer that I expect you to create. And then they continued uh, training um, the large language model with supervised learning. After that, you need to tell the model if it produces a good answer or not. So. Um, remember these models guess the next word in the sequence. So they're essentially probabilistic models. 
That means when you ask them the same question, you will get a different answer every time or most of the time. And because there's some randomness involved in creating the answer. So what they did here is they asked a question four times and they got four, four responses out of it. And then a person would rank these answers and say, this is the best, that's the worst. And they used this data to train yet another network, which is a reward model. And that learned to recognize good answers and uh, distinguish them from bad answers. And once you trained this model, you could use it then to continue the process automatically. So you would then run uh, the chat GPT um, model and give it questions to answer and the reward model would rank the output and this feedback signal was would then be used to continue training chat gpt so there's quite a lot of effort involved in building something like this and you need people so the the people that have done this here that's one of the issues around uh, how these models are being built um, they used uh, um, cheap labor to do this and um, that's something i'll come back to you uh, come back to in a minute um, so after you have done this for, for a long time and you spent a lot of money in, in compute building this model cost um, the estimate is cost about five million dollars to in cloud computing took over a month to train and required over a thousand gpus these are the kind of uh, chips that you normally have in graphic cards that you use for computer gaming these particular chips are very good for training these models um, the next thing that will come our way is then the generation of videos. So here's an example from Google, Google Image and Video. And it works in the same way. You have a prompt, um, teddy bear washing the dishes, and the output then is a video loop. If we take stock what we have today, the um, large language models like ChatGPT or BART or others, they basically have statistical text prediction, uh, which leads to impressive text generation capabilities. Essentially, you, you won't be able to say if a text has been created by one of these models or by a person. And that means you can think of interesting application scenarios if you carefully control um, what you do with these models. But there are a few drawbacks. So, these models are expensive to build and run. They are also called foundation models because they're, they can basically create text in any sort of context, in any sort of application. And you build a specific application on top of them. But they are very expensive to build and run. So you need millions of dollars in compute to build them. And you need terabytes of data. They are built largely from uncurated training data because you need terabytes of text to train them or terabytes of images you can't actually sit down and make sure you have only good data in there so there's in, in language data you will have a lot of bad language and you will have um, um, fake information in there you will have untruth and um, it is kind of impossible to get this sort of um, bad training data out of the training data repository that you build up because it's just too much. Um, these models work in a way that you have no real control over the output quality. So there's nothing that you can essentially do in crafting an input to get a guaranteed good quality output. And that means these models, they uh, can produce falsehoods. We call this hallucinations. They just make stuff up. And um, they are also prone to be biased. And this is, again, because of bias in the training data. Language is actually biased, and just the use of language is biased. And um, getting this out of the training data, again, is, is very, very hard. That means the outputs must always be validated. So you can't really rely on large language models producing something uh, useful until you checked it. So what sort of stuff can we do with them? So obviously you, you know ChatGPT, you probably have played with it. And so it can be quite entertaining to play with these large language models. But uh, in, in terms of actual use, what can you do with them? And the guiding principle for use cases is really look at something that is difficult to create, but easy to check. 
because as I said, you can't really rely on the correctness of an output. You need to check. You, so you need to think human in the loop kind of use cases. Um, one of the most obvious one is code programming languages. So software engineers can use these large, large language models to help them write code. And uh, because they can generate any sort of language or text, they have learned to produce um, output in computer languages. And so that means you can use it as part of your daily programming work, if you like. And because typically software uh, engineers are experts, they can very easily check if the output is actually useful. So they can ask uh, the model to give them a skeleton for a function they want to write. And they can then uh, fill in the details, or they can ask it for a particular uh, line of code for, for something very specific. And again, they can check if it makes sense. You can also, when you actually do this in a professional context, you can check if it gives you any benefits because software engineering is easily measurable because um, you use things like code repositories. So you can check um, how many bugs are you introducing, how many um, lines of code are being produced and what sort of time, how quickly does code go from development into production and so on. So when you try these large language models out in software engineering, you can very easily check uh, is there a benefit or not. Um, other things could be task sequences. So if you want to uh, generate things like processes, workflows, again, you have semi-formal language, which is relatively easy to check if it's correct or not. Then you can go into uh, use cases like short text production, copywriting, um, they, that would be creating um, text for marketing, for example. Again, you have somebody who knows what, what they want to write and what, what they want as an output, and they can very easily check if this is correct. So you, you're not asking the model to write me a novel. You, you just ask it to write you a short paragraph about something, and you can check it. Then um, other interesting use cases are document search. Because um, what you can do is you can ask for um, information by using natural language. And these models use the similarity of your language to the documents that they then retrieve. And the, um, this is uh, more powerful than just using keywords. So you would find documents even if what you say in your search text does not appear in the target document, but you found something that is similar to what you said. And this is exploiting the fact that when these models process language, they actually process embeddings. And an embedding is a numerical representation of text. And um, the embeddings are crafted in a way that similar words have similar numerical representations. And words that appear in similar contexts, again, have similar numerical representations. And that helps you with things like document search. You can also ask uh, these models to summarize text for you. So if you have a very lengthy document and you just want the gist of what's in there, some, uh, they can summarize. Um, again, you have to check because um, you don't, it's actually more difficult to check because you don't know what you're missing, right? So when you do document search and summarization, then uh, how do you know that it has actually retrieved everything that should be retrieved? Um, so it's a bit more tricky to figure out if this is actually useful for a professional use case. Uh, you can ask them to produce templated text. So if you have to fill in forms and things like that, that there can be a help there. And uh, you can ask them to contribute to complex text. So you don't really want them to um, uh, write the full, full novel for you, but um, maybe they can write you a paragraph. And then you take this paragraph and make sure it fits in the narrative. Or more interestingly, um, you want them to use I want to use them for com complex formal documents and um, um, then generate maybe uh, a paragraph for a contract. And then uh, you again have an expert in the loop, like a, a legal expert who can check that this is actually correct. You can also use them for images, video creation and editing and so on, but I, I won't cover this in this presentation. But there's a lot of opportunity uh, for the creative industry. So you find already find software that helps you editing movies, for example. And uh, so you could um, have a use case where you need to translate dialogue in a movie and the software can do the translation, produce translated 
voice in the actual voice of the actor and can then uh, also change the lip movements of the actor to make it fit the translation. So there's a lot of opportunity for, for this sort of um, applications as well. When you work with these models, or this is true for all sort of AI, you always should do ethical checks and you should check that what you're doing is responsible, uh, not only that it works, but that you're not causing harm in, inadvertently. So what should we check when we work with uh, generative AI or large language models? We should be aware of the curation of the training data. When these models have been built, has anybody actually spent any effort to get bias out of the data or to make sure that the data is of good quality or it comes from reliable sources? Is the, the data relevant to your use case? Actually, most use cases in the future will not rely on massive foundation models. Probably they will use smaller uh, large language models that have been trained specifically for use case on, on very well curated data. But uh, it's important to understand this. You, before you use a model, you should know how it was built and what went into it. Then you want to understand how good is it actually. So you want to see performance benchmarks. Do you actually know what you're getting it when, uh, when you use one of these models and you're using it to build an application? Um, ethical sourcing. I mentioned it before that ChatGPT was built um, using cheap labor and you find articles online about this. So if you need humans in the loop to uh, basically check the training success of these models, then um, what is often done is that companies go into um, the market for data labeling. And this work is usually outsourced into um, third world countries where labor is cheap. And if this happens, you really want to know that uh, this has been done in an ethical way and that people are fairly compensated for the work they're doing. And that's a big issue. And it's always important to look into that. <clears throat> Carbon footprint, as I said, these things use massive amounts of compute. And so if we look at, for example, ChatGPT as an example, and uh, look at how much effort was spent on training it, the compute is equivalent to, uh, in terms of carbon footprint, to 15 flights between London and Los Angeles, back and forth. So you're spending a lot of energy building them. And the bigger they are, obviously, the more money you spend on building them, but also on running them later in execution. So you need a lot of um, specialized hardware or cloud compute to actually execute them. So it's always worthwhile to look into what can I get away with? How big does this model really have to be for my use case? Or can I get away with something that is much smaller and cheaper to run? Let's have a look at a, an example of what is doable today. Here's an example from NVIDIA. And um, they have an example on, on YouTube, so you can watch, uh, watch the demo. And what they have here is a video communication system. And what it does, it modifies the video image. So you can see here on the left is the actual image, on the right is the modified image. So uh, the eyes of the person have been modified as uh, if she looks at the camera. In, in reality, she looks down at the keyboard. And so that's obviously, uh, in terms of communication, it's a nice effect, right? So it makes the communication more natural. And uh, even things like head position can be changed. And um, if you have an Apple iPhone, then go into your settings, find FaceTime, scroll to the bottom, and uh, you will potentially see a feature about eye correction or some, uh, similar. Apple is already using this sort of technology on its FaceTime and iPhones for about um, two, three years. And um, it wasn't really announced. It's, uh, it uh, is just being used and it's on by default. Um, so what you can also do is you can modify the language. So you can do online translation. So if um, the person speaks into the uh, software in English, it can come out in another language, for example, Spanish. And the software can also adjust uh, the lip movements so that it looks like the person is actually speaking Spanish. And uh, the language would come out in the voice of the person. So it's also um, the, the voice is uh, cloned to match uh, the voice of the speaker. 
So essentially, uh, if we take this uh, uh, further, you, you can't really be sure that I'm talking to you or that it's not somebody else who's using my likeness and my voice. And that's one of the issues here. So you can imagine that you can make video communication much better. And it's obviously great if you can communicate with somebody in a different language. But how do you trust these systems? How do you make sure that the person you're seeing is actually the person you, uh, you're communicating with? And how do you, as a speaker, can be sure that what you are saying into the system comes out uh, as intended and is not changed uh, on the way it is uh, going to the, the other person on the other end of the line? So these kind of capabilities allow us to do very interesting things with um, communication. But how do we make sure we can uh, trust these systems? So we need to think about things like watermarking, for example, that we can um, can say that uh, the image actually comes from a camera and it's not created as a deep fake. And uh, that we can somehow check what sort of modifications have been done to the picture, that this is um, documented and um, um, checkable. And in the same sense, the uh, you need to have the trust that what you say into the system comes out as intended when it's being translated. So that's that are future challenges that we need to address when we want to use these sort of capabilities. Um, there's more to generative AI than images and text. Um, I, I've called it the dark horse of generative AI here. The, um, these systems are being used uh, for scientific discovery, optimization, and configuration. And what does that mean? Um, for example, DeepMind, that's the company that built AlphaGo, the deep network that was playing Go better than any human, um, has a system that they use to discover more efficient matrix multiplication. They call it Alpha Tensor. And essentially, they use reinforcement learning for this, and they have honed these kind of capabilities from learning how to build deep, deep networks that can play games. And you may have seen deep networks that can play Atari games for example, and have learned how to do that, or, or things like Go. And, um, but you can also solve actual problems using these sort of methods. So if you treat um, matrix multipl multiplication like a computer game, then these systems can learn how to more, efficient, um, more efficiently uh, multiply matrices. And this is a technology that is underpinning the whole, whole area of deep networks. Essentially, computing with deep networks means doing a lot of matrix multiplication. So and if you can make that faster, then you, you make the whole world of AI faster and more efficient. Um, you've, you have also seen examples uh, called AlphaFold or Meta's evolutionary scale modeling. These are models that are applied to predicting the 3D shape of proteins, and that is essential for uh, drug discovery. So you can use these sort of models in completely different areas that you wouldn't normally think about. Um, and uh, Joshua Bengio, who is one of the, the, what they now call them godfathers of AI, that would be Jeff Hinton, Joshua Bengio, and uh, Jan Le Kuhn. They, uh, in 2018, got the Turing Award, which is kind of the um, Nobel Prize for computer science for their work in deep networks. And Yoshio Bengio's research now also looks at something called generative flow networks that are uh, models that create solutions for uh, complex problems. And IBM has a toolkit for scientific discovery. So I would expect that we see a lot more interesting stuff coming out of generative AI that goes beyond text and images. Um, you probably have heard uh, the discussion, especially around the worry around AI. Will this lead to superhuman AI, AGI, or anything like this? So basically systems that are uh, smarter than humans in all dimensions. But uh, most experts uh, are of the opinion that this is not the case. Just making these systems bigger and bigger and training them with more and more data will not lead to um, artificial general intelligence because essential things are missing. So these uh, models do not have knowledge representation. They don't have a world model. They, they don't work, can't work with associations and generalizations. So there are um, quite a few things missing uh, from a system where you would say this is actually uh, truly intelligent. But nevertheless, we need to look 
at um, what's called the AI control problem. So how do we make sure that these things work as intended and that they're used as intended and that they're not surprising us with uh, kind of outputs that we don't want? And essentially it means we need to be able to control um, the working of these systems and have effective guardrails. So if, for example, we, we would say that controlling a large language model would mean it should provide accurate, truthful and appropriate responses to questions, then all of these large language models are out of control because none of them do that, right? So they, they can produce accurate and truthful outputs, but they don't do it all the time. So they can make stuff up, they can produce um, incorrect uh, facts and uh, wrong outputs. And we have no way of preventing it. So we are not fully in control of what these systems are doing. And we need to be aware of, it, of that. And that means we need to mitigate. In any use case where we use a large language model, we must be aware that the output can be wrong and there must be mitigation built into this. Um, developers don't really understand what they're building. Um, I'm always saying there's too much alchemy and not enough science and engineering. So when developers build these deep networks, sometimes they uh, can do stuff which uh, the developers didn't expect and they can't explain why that is. And we are not in a state yet that we can explain why one of these models has created the output it has created. So basically our scientific understanding of these models is lacking behind the capabilities that they demonstrate. And we need to get better at this. We need to implement guardrails and be open about the data used for training. So the whole tech industry that builds these models needs to get their act together on this. And we also need more well-funded, dedicated AI safety research, research that explicitly looks at how we uh, control these uh, systems and make sure that we get the output we expect and how we can find out that the output is not what we expect. Um, future innovation is expected to come from open source. So we probably won't see things like GPT-4, GPT-5, GPT-6, or things like this coming out uh, much longer in the kind of the way we've seen in the past. The, the theory is, or the expectation is that uh, you can do things better and cheaper if you build smaller models and if you combine them. And so I would expect to see more progress coming out of the open source area with uh, surprising capabilities. And this will be built on open source models that are smaller, more efficient, and models that are working in combination that might produce, again, very interesting um, capabilities. But it will be even harder to control because you're not only controlling one model, now you're controlling many models that work together. So we really need to work on this problem space. There's also an impact of generative AI on uh, the population, which we need to uh, understand and we need to keep an eye on. Essentially, releasing these sort of mo models into the public sphere is an unprecedented social experiment on a global scale. People will change the way they interact with information. Um, proliferation of deep fakes might change the way we see and believe in, in, in videos and images, for example. And um, there has been something similar after things like Photoshop became available, right? So you, you, uh, the way people look at images or even look at, at movies and special effects has changed over the, the decades. And this is going to introduce yet another step change in the way we uh, perceive and work with information. We need to get our head around because we will all be exposed to it. It's going to be uh, a kind of a change like we experienced a change after the internet became uh, a public thing or after smartphones were um, available to people. And this is yet another thing that will change uh, um, society in, in a way that we don't fully understand yet. Um, if we're working in this field, uh, it's our responsibility to encourage responsible use of generative AI. And uh, we also need to help out regulators and help them debating um, what sort of regulatory frameworks are useful to keep this uh, technology uh, beneficial to people. All right, here have um, a few recommended readings if you, if you want to learn more about the space. Um, 
the um, slides will be available as a PDF. I don't know how Chiara will send them out, or if you can't get hold of them, you can ask me. Uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Detlef, for that fantastic presentation and that uh, it's a great overview of the capabilities and risks of uh, generative AI at this moment in time. Um, yes, we can send the PDF out to all attendees after this, so no worries. And um, please also do feel free to connect with Detlef anyway. And we have got a few questions um, in the chat box. So I think I'll start with Edgar. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, presentation and event. Uh, by the way, IBM is uh, uh, already la launched uh, uh, Podsonix, which is also generated AI in April. So maybe you should have a look if you didn't. Uh, my question is, um, do you think uh, uh, chat GPT or generative AI can be used in uh, uh, to making a translator for dialects? different dialects and new languages. I guess uh, there are only 10 languages that ChatGPT, for example, is using. And also, what do you think how uh, things can uh, be changed after using quantum computers in, in these technologies? OK. Um, yeah, I'm sure you, you can use these models to translate between dialects and understand dialects. It just depends on um, the examples and the training data that is used to train these models. That goes back to the curation, right? You, you, you want to make sure that the data that uh, is relevant to your use case has actually been used in, in training these models. And you may want to look at building specialized models. You don't need to have a model that can do everything. A model that is um, um, specific to the use case might actually be better and easier to control and easier to train. Uh, quantum computing, yeah, is uh, obviously interesting, is yet another thing that is uh, going to change things. It's still very much in its infancy. You can't really afford to buy yourself a quantum computer yet. But uh, essentially what it means, uh, it will speed up um, the compute in the space. If it means compute will be uh, not only faster, but also cheaper, uh, we don't know yet because we have no real idea what commercial co quantum computers will look like. Thank you. So you think uh, the, it is possible to create a new uh, translator, which will just uh, translate all kind of dialects, understand and uh, make yep. data. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And if we just move on to Fatima, who I think if you want to unmute Fatima, you can ask the question. I did see Fatima unmute briefly and then uh, I'm not sure if it's working, so. How about now? Can yes. you hear me? Okay, amazing, thank you. Just a quick question, um, because I work with sustainability related topics. So um, I got interested when you mentioned that uh, you need to do the ethical checks of, um, I guess the output that comes out of this, uh, um, like chat GPT, for instance. So um, how can you, I just want to understand a little bit more how can they know whether a uh, cheap labor perhaps was involved in in the in the data that was used for these uh, models to generate the output? And I guess perhaps a little bit in terms of the carbon emissions, it's a little bit easier, but I don't know. So I would like to hear a bit more of uh, your insights. How can they actually make sure this was uh, involved? Well, yeah, good good question. You, you really only know if the developers or the, the, um, uh, the companies that built these systems own up to how they did it and what they used. Uh, for ChatGPT, there was an article in Time magazine about um, the labor forces that were used to, to build the model. Uh -huh. And But you rely on um, this information being made available. Otherwise, you, <laughs> you would need kind of investigative journalism to find out. Um, yeah, energy consumption is easier because you can um, just go into cloud computing systems and if you know the size of these models and the amount of training data, you can make some educated guesses how long it will train to build them. And uh, because you know it from other examples, mm -hmm. you can uh, figure out how expensive it is. So we have some numbers for GPT-3 or ChatGPT. Uh, we don't know yet, for example, for GPT-4 because OpenAI hasn't released any information. We don't really know how big the model is 
how long did it uh, take to train it, um, how much training data was used. So if the companies don't release this information, it's very difficult to find out. Yeah, okay then, thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Fatima. I think we have um, one more question from Elroy. If you'd like to unmute Elroy. I'm not sure if Elroy can unmute, so I can go ahead and read his question out. It was, it basically says, Hi Detlef, thank you for the session, which was very illuminating. At the beginning, you touched upon the number of perimeters that generative AI models have. Please, can you explain what a perimeter is? Yeah. Okay, so essentially these models are very simple computing units that can be active or inactive and they're all networked together. And each co connection between two units has a weight, which is a number. And the way these numbers are used is they uh, take the information that comes out of one unit, the, out the output is multiplied with this weight or this number, this parameter, and this is then fed into the next unit. And this is how these models work. They, they compute uh, by multiplying numbers with, with each other. And these numbers are called parameters. And uh, GPT-3, what underpins ChatGPT, has 175 billion of these numbers. And in a computer system, you need to represent a number with four bytes because it's a, a floating point number, so a number with a decimal part. And um, so if you have 175 times four makes 700, so you, you have um, 700 um, billion of these numbers, so roughly 700, uh, sorry, 700 billion bytes that you need to put into the computer. That is roughly 700 gigabytes. And just as an example, if you have a smartphone that usually has something like, uh, if you have a large one, maybe 64 gigabytes of, of memory. So you can imagine that you, you, you would need to have something like 10 smartphones next to each other to be able to uh, run ChatGPT. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Alroy. Um, yeah, great. And we have one more from Mohammed, actually. As a researcher, will it be ethical to use GPT? <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, there's a lot of discussion of can you use uh, these things uh, to generate text for you that you then use in your own work. If you do that, I would always recommend to disclose the fact that you have done it. And obviously, you should <laughs> take the text and uh, check if it's actually useful for you, and uh, you should edit it uh, as, as a minimum. The, uh, a lot of kind of schools um, say you shouldn't use ChatGPT at all in your work, or if, if you write your master thesis or something like this, I would uh, avoid doing this because your professor might not be happy about it. And, uh, but this is one of the things that we still need to get our head around. What is actually acceptable in terms of using these things in everyday kind of production of text, right? So if you, if you write an essay maybe and you need an, uh, a fancy title for it, uh, these systems can be very helpful in suggesting ideas and, and then you pick one. And, um, or if you need to explain something in simple terms, uh, it might, these systems might be very, very helpful. I would uh, suggest if you use them, say that you did. Yes, thanks Detlef. It's definitely gonna be an interesting period for us all. As you mentioned, it's a bit of a social experiment with this technology yes. at the minute, particularly in higher education. Um, but yes, if you don't have any more questions, thank you all for attending and thank you Detlef for the fantastic presentation. Oh, there's one more in the chat box. I think we have time if that's okay with you Detlef. Yeah, okay. Uh, can you delve more into the impossible AGI accomplishment through LLM training? Um, I think that that goes to the, um, uh, the, fr um, the quote from Jan LeCun that you, even if you train a large language model until the end of time, you won't get something that's intelligent. So the, the background here is um, um, in, in the recommended reading, there's a book by Margaret Mitchell. Um, I, I recommend to have a look into this one. She explains quite well what do you need if you want to build an intelligent system and what sort of 
kind of uh, components an intelligent system would have. And uh, what we see at the moment, large language models, they uh, learn everything from the statistics of language. And that is not sufficient to represent world, world models that humans have when they do reasoning and when they understand concepts and how, how things relate to each other and, and how things are working. So you can't really derive certain things just from language. You need to do uh, more and you need to actively represent things like concepts and knowledge and uh, relationships between concepts and so on. And um, just by uh, learning from statistically from language, you're very unlikely to get anything like this. These models have some sort of internal representations, but we just don't understand what they are. We just know they're different to what we have and um, that might give them certain capabilities, but not others. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think we're coming towards the end of the, the hour. So we'll wrap up this session. But thank you to everyone for attending and please do come for our other, um, register for our other sessions this afternoon. We have one actually on data ethics, which will be particularly interesting, followed by the beauty and value of data visualization. And once again, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation, Detlef, and we'll be circulating the slides afterwards. Thank you for having me, my pleasure. No problem. Thank you and see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.